um, your, like your address, name, email address, um, is all going to be sent to the to the this page. And the next thing that's also very important is something called the method. Um, there are only two types of methods in forms, a get and a post. I'm going to explain that more thoroughly in a second. Um, so, yeah, so the main thing um, to take away from forms is that it allows us to pass values uh, to the server. So before, we sort of interacted by just sending, requesting a certain page from the server and then pulling that back in. So now we're going to be able to do some more specific things like telling it, like for example, if you go to like google.com and you search something, um, we, you pass parameters to Google servers and then they output a, um, a specific specialized result for you based off of those parameters. So get, um, so like I said, there are two types of ways of passing parameters to the servers. One is by something called a get request and um, a GET request is very easily identified by looking at the URL. Uh, I'm just going to go back to the Google example again. Um, if you start typing in stuff and you press enter, and you look at your URL bar, you're going to be able to see some parameters inside of the URL which tell Google um, things like your browser, um, search terms, um, search options, like if you want to do a safe search or whatever. Um, so and it's very, um, the, way, the way you can tell or what values are being passed is by sort of looking at everything past the URL. Um, so in the next slide, I'm going to go through examples. So this is sort of more abstract. Um, so you start with the URL. And then after the URL, you put a question mark. And what that question mark does is it delineates and tells you from now on, everything that I give you is going to be some key value pair that you can parse through um, and do some stuff to. right? So. In this case, we have key one, and it equals value one, and key two equals value two, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense to everybody? Can you raise your hands if that makes sense? No? OK. You have a question then, no? No, I was going to say, I okay. think the example will help. OK. Uh, we'll move to the example then. <laughs> Good. Good example. Um, this is a server you're going to be dealing with in your lab. So um, Alex has set up his server uh, with the domain twitter.decal.awindustries.com. Um, so that's going to be our URL. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be our URL. And um, you can imagine that we attach this string right here to the end of the URL. I haven't done so because it was really long um, and it made it unclear. So this would go right after this URL here. Uh, and what we do is we start off by uh, delineating the parameters by a question mark. And then we have something called the key. Um, this is sort of badly named uh, because in this case, the actual the key name is called key. Um, so and it has a value, Twitter greater than Twitter. Uh, and then we separate the next key value pair by an ampersand. And in this case, we add um, a key called created after. And that's going to equal some random time. Is that clear to everybody or not? So what the server does is it's not what you kind of pass it. It's going to generate you know, its response to you. So this, in this case, and you'll see in the lab, what it's going to do is um, we're using the key just to check that you know, you're from the class. And then that create after date is going to, the server is going to use that to look at all the messages that are posted to our Twitter and then return messages that are after that date. Yeah, uh, this might be make more sense after you see the application. Um, okay. So the next thing um, that's, that was the other type of method, the way of sending parameters to um, the server, is something called a post method or post request, and um, it's not as easily seeable. Um, as a get request is, meaning that the parameters that you pass in are not going to show up in the URL at all. They're sort of passed in uh, through a separate channel, um, which is a post request. And the way you the way you can tell um, what's being passed in the post request is by opening something like Firebug. And in this case, um, if you click .net, uh, it'll 
sort of retrieve all the actions that are posts or the, all the requests that have been made from the page. And um, you can, if you click on post here, you can see that there are two parameters. Uh, the first is first name Mickey, that's the key, that's the value, that's the key, that's the value. So um, post requests also work in key value pairs, but it's just that these key value pairs aren't passed through the URL, they're passed through sort of a separate channel. So when you're deciding um, what sort of method to get or what sort of method to use, you have to sort of weigh a bunch of factors in. Um, there's some really easy general guidelines, but for a lot of, for some stuff, um, deciding whether you want to use post versus get is debatable. Um, there's some clear, re uh, some clear cases where you do want to use post though. Uh, one of them is that you're, you have like some password field, um, like in a login box. You want to pass those parameters through uh, a post request. Um, one of the main reasons is that it's secure. Because the parameter is not being passed in the URL box, no one can look over your shoulder and say, hey, I know your password. So if you were to do like some sort of login box using a get request, all those parameters would have to be appended in the URL and passed into the, to the server through the URL, uh, meaning that on that page when it's loaded, you're going to be able to see the password in plain text. Uh, the other good thing about post is that it can handle a uh, lengthy um, lengthy parameters, let's say, I don't know, you have like a hundred, um, it might be better to do a post because there's some browsers like, for example, Internet Explorer, which limit the, the size of the, um, the URL box um, to a certain character length. So you won't be able to pass as much parameters as you can in post. Uh, the, other, the other thing um, about get, which is good, is that by using get requests, the server can cache those requests. Uh, when you use post, it doesn't cache it. And what I mean by caching is that it remembers those requests. So for example, you Google um, the Beatles. And that's going to be done through get request. And the server can then like do its alt information, computation, whatever, and give you the results for the Beatles. Right? And if someone else, like some other part of the world did the Beatles too, wanted to search for the Beatles, Instead of having the server recompute everything based off those parameters, it can just say, hey, I've done this already. I have it in my sort of uh, chest of things done, and I can give it to you without having to do a lot of computation. So um, these are sort of things you might not have to deal much with, uh, depending on what you're, what you're building uh, in terms of a website. Um, another cool thing is get requests can be bookmarked. So, you can, if you notice that, um, if you search something um, through Google, you can bookmark that search and make sure that next time you visit that bookmark, it's gonna give you the same, um, it's gonna have the same parameters in the search results. And that allows you to be able, that allows you to sort of pass those search results to your friends. So let's just say you're Googling um, Britney Spears and you found something really cool on the front page of Google uh, in the search results, and you wanted to send it to your friend, so you just copy that URL, which has all the parameters already, and you give it to your friend, and they can open it, and they'd see exactly what you're seeing. Uh, you couldn't do that with the post request, because a post request requires a form and a separate channel, uh, sort of separate channel of submission for those um, parameters to the server. Oh, so. So, um, is, is everyone okay with that? And it's like, it's not super important that you, oh, okay, it's kind of important that you understand it, but for the purposes of our class, um, more specifically the lab, you won't have to figure out which one you're gonna use. Um, but it's sort of just, I brought it up here, it's informational because it's sort of something that you need to know or be aware about uh, when you're developing stuff on the web. Okay, so now we're doing some cooler stuff. Um, something called Ajax. So what is Ajax? Uh, that is not Ajax. So uh, when we talk about Ajax in this class, we're not talking about your household cleanser. We're talking about a, a technology um, that allows us to, to interact with 
of the web in an asynchronous manner. And I'll explain what asynchronous means. Um, so AJAX, if you break it down, it's an acronym. Uh, it stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Uh, asynchronous means that it's able to fetch data, um, fetch and send data to the server without having to do a page reload. So, for example, um, when you um, update your Facebook status, you post, you, you enter some status in your box, um, like I'm having fun at the decal right now. Uh, just don't be on Facebook right now. So, um, so you do that, and what it does is it sends that request, it sends that, that status to the server without having you to go through another page. And it does that by, by doing some AJAX calls. Um, so, more of an overview, like the way in which it's asynchronous, or so, so synchronous means that it comes along with the page after you load it. So you, you contact uh, Facebook, and they send you the entire page. That's the synchronous action. Every request within that page thereafter is an asynchronous action. So it's out of sort of out of the time, the, the uh, typical time slot. Um, so the next thing is JavaScript. Uh, you know what that is already. So the other thing is XML. Um, you won't really have to worry about this at all, but um, just for clarification purposes and for your knowledge, um, it's a markup language, just like HTML, uh, and it looks something like this. And uh, what XML is usually used for is to pass parameters from the server to, uh, to like, um, to the client. So, I mean, the client, if, if the server sent all this information to the client, um, the client could parse through this file and say, hey, look, uh, I want to show some books. And like, in this case, we have books with the title, um, Ajax for Dummies, and Publisher Berkeley Books, an author some guy you've never heard of. Um, so that's what XML is in a nutshell. You don't have to worry about that, though, uh, for the most part. Um, key thing about JavaScript is, right, it's client-side technology, as we discussed about earlier in the slide. OK, so um, more explanation on how Ajax works. Uh, so we have a set of synchronous actions, uh, which are the actions that happen when you send a request, and then you upload, or and the server responds back to the request, that web page request. Um, so in the first part, we have, oh, just kidding, let me do a demo. demo on Ajax. Uh, so we have maps.google.com. And if we do something like, for example, zoom in here, if you notice what this is doing is it's doing Ajax calls. The page didn't refresh at all. Okay. So um, what it does is it basically redraws the map um, by giving you like the enlarged image each time. So you can kind of see it in that everything is refreshed uh, in the images. So that's how it does its um, zooming. So I'll explain how that works with this diagram here. Um, so you visit Google maps on google.com. Uh, it responds to you and gives you a search of that web page. Then there's a set of asynchronous calls. Um, in this place, every time, every time you clicked on the plus sign, it had a dot, sort of a equivalent of a dot click function. And it triggered and said, hey, I need the a redraw of the map. You need to give me some more data so that I can see the zoomed in images. So um, probably in that case, there are like a set of like divs inside the, the map. There's probably like four or so. And uh, what that does is it Google just sends you the new images to take place of those divs. And it's just going to be magnified. Um, so that happens all here, sort of in between, or after the synchronous actions. Um, so that you don't have to do page refreshes. Does that make sense? Can you tell me if that makes sense? Raise your hand. Okay, so for some of you, it doesn't make sense. Why? 